So, welcome everybody. I hope you can hear me and see me. This is the third lecture in my course on the Arahant and the Four Truth in Early Buddhist Discourse. Yeah, I start again going through some of the points that were raised on the blog, which has been very, very lively. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, the first uh, topic I'm going to take up is the meaning of dukkha. There was one, <coughs> forgive me, one contribution by Rodolfo Rivas Molina, and I think it's good just to remind us that he says that there are three different types of dukkha. And I just wanted to give the canonical reference for that. <coughs> One occurrence we have in the Sangiti Sutta, that is the 33 discourse in the Diganikaya, and in the Pali text edition, this is volume 3, page 216. So this distinguishes between outright pain, between the fact that everything is conditioned, and between and the fact that everything is bound to change. So this is just one very good point also. And as Rodolfo says, suffering, the translation suffering would only cover the first of these three meanings. And there was also a contribution by Manfred Wiesberger. And yeah, I think I give you the whole. <coughs> He says, as to phrasing the Four Noble Truth in terms of Dukkha, I think the answer is fairly simple. The Buddha started his search because he could not accept old age, sickness and death, the observable form of Dukkha. And he ended up with seeing the underlying psychological workings of the experienced Dukkha, namely Paticca Samopada or Dependent Arising. So on the one hand, it is his central theme. On the other, it is an established formula on how to treat illnesses. Yeah, the, the term dukkha was already in use, apparently, as far as we can tell. So we find even uh, non-Buddhists formulating the aim, for example, the giants formulating the aim of their practice to get out of dukkha. So the usage of this term is not specifically Buddhist. What is specifically Buddhist is the way how it is used or what it is used for. And there was another contribution by Venerable Kongu. <coughs> he wants us to notice also that impermanence also has a positive aspect. He says it is exactly impermanence in its functional aspect of law of cause and effect that allows the process of training, purification and eventual liberation to take place. So the impermanence dukkha link may not always be a negative thing. And I think this further supports my argument that we cannot uh, 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 confine our understanding of dukkha to suffering. Yeah, then I still continue a little bit with Dukkha, and maybe then I leave some room for question. <coughs> this is a little bit now in relation to the Arahant. This is Dania Percy, and she she brings in a position that is uh, very common in tradition, in the Theravada tradition, where it is... Um, thought that the Arahant experiences pleasure as disgusting and would abandon it once he gets the chance. So the Arahant just continues out of compassion, but would parinibbana, that is, he would finally or she would finally pass away and abandon even pleasure, since that too is dukkha. Yeah, I'm very glad that this um, very widespread understanding within the Theravada tradition has been formulated so clearly because it's something that I actually, I'm, I'm going to challenge this a little bit, I think. Yeah, I, 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 my understanding is that this notion of the Arahant, who experiences everything basically as just disgusting, everything as uh, 
is a, basically a form of suffering and the only reason why the Arahant doesn't kill himself or herself is because uh, these poor lay people, they have to get a chance to make merit. This is an understanding that I do not see in the early suttas. This is what I, I, I and, and this is in fact one of the real points that I want to make in this uh, series of lectures on the Arahant, that we try to see, and you are certainly uh, completely free to disagree with me, but that we try to see if there's uh, some degree of a historical development between the way an Arahant is depicted in the early suttas and the way he or she is later understood by tradition. And before we get time to discuss this, there's a few more contributions I want to put in, and then I hand over the ball to you on the same topic. This is Manfred Wiesberger again. So he says, there is some propaganda around that revulsion is a necessary feeling to turn away from samsara. That sounds to me rather extreme. To my mind, it should be enough to see clearly, sober instead of revolted, that whatever it is, it cannot quench my inherent desire for lasting happiness, precisely because it never ever is or stays just the way I want it. Yeah, I feel very much in agreement with what Manfred has said there. <clears throat> then this is from Giuliana Martini. She says, Dukkha is not simply painful and pain. This is also clear from the perspective of the end of Dukkha, liberation. Yeah, and this falls in again with this idea of the Arahant. You see, if everything is suffering, <clears throat> then the end of Dukkha, the, end, the ending of Dukkha will only be attainable after this life. But that is not the case, and this is not what we get in the suttas. We get a very clear shift in perspective compared to the contemporary setting that the, the final goal is to be attained in this very life itself. The Arahant is, reaches the, the Dukkha Kaya, the destruction of Dukkha here and now, and not only at the time when he or she passes away. And there's one more contribution. This is by Rosa Grau, and she says, I'm sure that an Arahant enjoys his life much more than we do. Yeah, and this is, this is actually also what I think. There's one passage I want to quote. I just put in the references. This is Majima Nikaya 89. Pali text edition, volume 321. The translation is from Bhikkhu Bodhi, page 730. So here's a king, and he comes to visit the Buddha, and he pays his respect, and he pays it in a very, a uh, little bit exaggerated manner. And the Buddha says, why do you feel so inspired? And says, so the king says, look, and now I'm reading Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. When I come here, I see Bhikkhu smiling and cheerful, sincerely joyful, plainly delighting, their faculties fresh, living at ease, unruffled, subsisting on what others give, abiding with mind as aloof as a wild deer. Yeah, if we try to picture what this king has been seeing, then it, it, clearly these, these, these monks are enjoying what they are doing. They are happy. There's a whole, whole chapter on happiness in the Dhammapada. Obviously, I'm not saying they are enjoying sensuality. No, no way. But an, an, an arahant is not someone who sees everything as disgusting. I, I don't think so. Anyway, the ball is with you now. Any questions, comments, criticism? So Lisa Fankert, she says, Dear Banta, I could not post on the blog. The Buddha designed his teaching for the human organism neurologically. We experience everything as stress. Sensual pleasure in many ways is a stress on the system that makes tranquility within our human system impossible by its nature. 
Any experience is a stress on the system. I have seen Dukkha translated as stress, but I cannot remember where. But it is accepted in modern science that we have pleasurable stress as well as stress that is not experienced as pleasure. It seems that the tranquil state, equanimity or even joy, it, it is neurophysiologically different from the arising and passing of sensual experiences. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah. I have to apologize. I have a little cold, so I'm going to cough and do all these things now. <laughs> Yeah, Venom Kongmu says that it's Venom Tanisaro. Tanisaro Biko translates Dukkha as stress. John Emmer, he says, from today's reading, Sariputta says he is filled with horror, loathing, and disgust of this foul body of mind. This seems difficult to align with the enjoyment of life since the body is always present. Yeah, I'm, I'm precisely going to come to that point. Yeah, I, I have, I have uh, difficulties with that passage. Good that you pointed out. Rosa Grau. There's an emphasis in early Buddhism on looking at what is ugly. I do not understand that. Yeah, the asuba, uh, this is about getting out of sensuality. The contemplation of asuba is trying to see that the body is made up of different parts and that uh, our perception of myself as being beautiful or a person of the opposite gender as being beautiful uh, is something that only goes skin deep. If I go further in, if instead of taking off my clothes or the clothes of the other person, I also take off my skin or their skin, the whole beauty disappears. So there's there's a very clear point behind the Asuba practice. It, it is a tool to help the meditator to overcome sensual desire. And because of being able to overcome sensual desire, then the meditator will be able to experience real happiness in, in meditation, in concentration. If one is involved with sensuality, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to go deep in the concentration. Buddhism, early Buddhism clearly deconstructs the notion that the human body as such is beautiful. Which does not mean that we should be getting into aversion towards the body. In fact, what John just pointed out, uh, and I'm going to discuss this when we come to the discourse, I find it difficult to imagine that an Arant has, how did he put it? Yeah, filled with horror, loathing, and disgust at this foul body of mine. Yeah, difficult. But we, we come to that when we get to the discourse. I think I continue with the next topic. There's still something more from the from the blog. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, on Madhyama Agama 22, there's a contribution by Michael Beisert. He says, the discussion between Udayan and Sariputta concerns the cessation of feeling and perception. The Buddha considers the monk that attains the four jhanas worthy of respect and says nothing about cessation, which supposedly is a high attainment. I don't know how to interpret that, but it looks odd. Yeah, that's a very keen observation. My personal explanation of this would be that in both uh, versions we have a reference to the four jhanas and to the destruction of the influxes. So I, I suppose the point was to give uh, uh, to to mention the acme of normal jhana development and then the acme of insight development without getting into all the details. I would say that somebody who gets the first jhana would also be worthy of respect, and somebody who is a stream entra also worthy of respect. So we don't get all the individual points like listed out because it would just get very long. If uh, we would go like, uh, and a first uh, jhana attainment who has stream entry, and a second jhana attainment who has stream entry, and so on. I mean, it would have been nice if they mentioned cessation also, but I would personally think it's possible that this was implicitly included by mentioning four jhanas and the destruction of the influxes. Yeah, then there was uh, John Emmer, 
and he was asking if there's a difference between the initial objection by Venom Udayin in between the Pali version and the Madhyama Agama version. And I followed it up and I got down the Pali and the Chinese and I have it here on my screen, one below the other, and it looks like one has been translating from the other. <laughs> so all the differences we make out are because of these English translations. And I'm, I'm really sorry about that. There's not really much we can do. You see, because of copyright restrictions, I can only put up the hair translation. And Bhikkhu Bodhi has just uh, recently written to me that he is reading the proofs of his Anguttara Nikaya translation. So this is going to come out by the end of this year, sure, and we will all have finally a reliable translation of the Anguttara. But for the time being, you see, the, I, the point is that what, what I'm trying to do in this uh, series of lectures is to give you a first feeling of these discourses and to, to, to touch on some central points. If we were to do a thorough and proper comparative study of, say, the Majima Agama 22 and its Pali parallel, this would take us a whole semester. And you would need to be knowing all these languages. So this is not what I want to do, and this is also not why most of the students have enrolled in the course. So I, I basically, I present you some central points from the discourse, but I'm not going to go for each small difference. I just pick up those differences that I think are worthwhile for us to discuss and reflect on. And based on the feedback I got last year, I always try to also stir in the direction of what does it practically mean? What, what can we do with this? And this is also the reason why, even though I have this um, Pali and Chinese here now on my screen, I'm not going to paste it in now. I'm tempted to, but I don't. Because I am a little bit afraid that if we are going to use too much Pali and Chinese in our discussion, that there will be part of uh, those, we have over 400 students that are enrolled in this course, and there will be quite a part of them who will feel like put off or uh, feel at least, I mean, it makes no sense to them. So I think I will try myself to, to, I mean, if it's just a single word, like last lecture we had Viraga, or was it on the first lecture, no, the second lecture, just a single word that needs to be clarified, then fine. But I, I, I think it's good for those of us who are familiar with all the canonical languages, if we keep in mind that for us it's just like, it's lovely. Oh, look here, the Pali reads like this, and the Chinese says this. But uh, many others will be, uh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, okay. I don't get anything, but never mind. And if they get frustrated, then all the beautiful contributions that these uh, students are able to make because of their practically dealing with the sutras and making sense of it, that will be lost. So I'm, yeah, I'm leaving the Pali and Chinese here, but anybody of you wants, I, I can send you an email, no? <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to go into a different topic now, so if there is any question on the two points I have mentioned now, this would be a good time to throw it into the chat. Yeah, then I continue. I'm now getting a little bit into methodology. There was a question by Michael Beisert about uh, a suggestion by Johannes Bronkhorst. He has written a book called The Two Traditions of Meditation, Ancient India. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Johannes Bronkhorst thinks that uh, immaterial attainments, these four uh, attainments of boundless space and boundless consciousness, etc., that can be attained when one has already achieved the four absorptions, that these were not part of the original Buddhist teachings. And Rosa Grau adds that somebody seems to think that uh, this is a later development trying to harmonize the views of different schools. Yeah, and there's a nice opportunity for me to make a little statement on methodology. You see, um, scholarship on Buddhism uh, uh, can be very helpful, and this is why I am a scholar and trying to present a scholarly research to you, but it also has its limits. 
And uh, we need to be aware of the extent to which we can rely on certain statements or not. There has been a different suggestions on the nature of early Buddhism, what the Buddha taught. And we have been told by a very good scholar, Caroline Rice Davids, that the Buddha didn't teach not self, no. How could he teach something like this? Such a wonderful person, the Buddha. How could he not know that there's a self? No. This was all added by later monk reductors who changed the true teaching of the Buddha. And we get similar statements about the five aggregates. I think that was I.B. Horner, if I remember correctly. The Buddha never taught five aggregates. And he also didn't taught, teach uh, dependent arising. And here he didn't teach the four immaterial attainments. And at one point I collected a list of all the things that, according to Buddhist scholarship, uh, the Buddha never taught. And uh, the wonderful result I got was that the, the Buddha didn't teach anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now we have to stop the lecture. There's nothing left for us to discuss, I think. The point is that I can basically say of anything that the Buddha taught it or didn't teach it if I use this type of argument. Well, later on they put it or took it out or shifted it around. They mixed it all up. The Buddha... The Buddha taught Mahayana and all these uh, narrow-minded Theravada monks, they took out all these nice teachings. Any argument of that type is possible, but uh, for us, as those who hear this type of uh, explanation, we should just notice, look, this is just an opinion. What this person says has not really much ground to stay on, and what I'm trying to do here is different. Because here we have a Pali version and a Chinese Agama version and sometimes a fragment here or something there. We have a different lines of the oral transmission that we are tapping into and we are comparing them. And sometimes we find differences. And so there is some, some real ground for us to stand on. And then we can say, look, these are the same. The different traditions are the same, and there is no major, there is no major logical inconsistency. Then this is as far as we can go back. Nobody of us is able to say this is what the Buddha taught. We can't say that, but we can say this is as far as we can go back. We must be very, very close to what the Buddha taught, and this is the this position of early Buddhism, and. In early Buddhist scriptures, in the Pali discourses, the Chinese Agamas, we find that the immaterial attainments are mentioned again and again and again. So there is, as far as I can see, not much basis in the textual sources that we have to say this was added later. Now, these four immaterial attainments are a, a, a block of text, and doing all transmission, what often can happen is that uh, maybe the sutta originally only mentions the four jhanas, the four absorptions, I'm sorry, no Pali, and because they are so closely associated with the four immaterial attainments, then a reciter accidentally keeps on reciting and in the end we get one version where these are more. So we might have two discourses, one just has the four absorptions, I'm just making a hypothetical example, and the other one has the four absorptions and the four immaterial attainments. We, we might get these things, but these are usually the outcome just of oral transmission. They do not necessarily mean that the immaterial attainments were not known to the Buddha or to his contemporaries and were put in at a later time. Where we can make statements is when something is not found at all. And here we come to another point raised by Rodolfo Rivas Molina, and he wanted to know about the store consciousness, the Alaya Vijnana. And so the store consciousness is clearly not mentioned anywhere in the early discourses, nor its counterpart, the Bhavanga Chitta, the, the subliminal mind, how do you translate it, that we find in the Theravada tradition. And both result out of a philosophical development that set in only after early Buddhism. So here we can make very clear statements. This is a later development. 
And just to complete my reply to Rodolfo Rivas Molina, he was asking, well, I, I, I just paste in the whole question, and then there's again time for you to question, uh, ask any questions. He says, it would be interesting to know what the old discourses say about the store consciousness, or what actually transmigrates that marks our inclinations in future lives, or makes it possible to enter temporarily the cessation of perception and feeling. Yeah, as I said, the Alaya Vijnana, the store consciousness, and also the Bhavanga, which has this function in the evolved Theravada tradition, is unknown to the early discourses. What we get, there's one reference here I want to give. This is in the Diga Nikaya, volume 3, uh, 100, page 105. This is the Pali text edition. We get the Vijnana Sota, the flow or flux of consciousness. And this needs to be understood in conjunction with another explanation we get in the Majjhima Nikaya, volume 1, page 256, that it is definitely not the same consciousness that is reborn. This is about the information we get. You see, the early discourses, this is, I think, a very important characteristic. They are prescriptive, not descriptive. They prescribe the path to liberation and sometimes also things that are not immediately related to that. But they do not set themselves the task of giving us a complete map, of describing all and everything. This is only a task taken up later by the Abhidharma and Shastra traditions. So this, 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 this question, uh, this kind of questions, we, we often don't get a clear-cut statement as we get in later tradition. But we just get these hints out of which we can make sense and say, well, you see, the continuity after death as far as uh, what later on was explained to be the store consciousness or the subliminal mind, in the suttas what we can match this with is this idea of a flux of consciousness, a stream of consciousness out of which uh, every moment is changing and which is not the same. It doesn't. It, there's nothing unchanging, eternal, fixed, stable within that stream. That is about as much as we can say. Yeah, there's time for questions and comments now before I go into the next topic. Marta Turner said, I would like to see that list. Oh, <laughs> I have to look up where I have it. <laughs> I think I put some of these points in a paper called um, something on the Chinese Agamas. While I wait for questions, I just briefly look at what I tell you because I think that can be downloaded from the internet. You have reflections on comparative Agama studies. You can get it from my a list of publications at the University of Hamburg. Just Google list of publications, Analeo, and there's all these articles. Don't read the whole list, it's terrible. But just reflections on comparative Agama studies. I should, at the end, have several of these points. I'm not sure if the whole list is there. Anyhow. Yeah, so I think I go for the next topic. That's about the strong language used by the Buddha when he rebukes uh, Ananda for not uh, for, for, for keeping silent when Venerable Sariputta is being uh, vexed. So it's Gabriel Korenz who says, the Chinese version may go overboard in the Buddha's criticism and the essential point is intervening with a calm mind. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My question is this, what is the utility of phrasing the condemnation in this language? It seems neither to illustrate a calm intervention nor reflect the noble qualities of the Buddha. Why would the author's transcribers of these versions use these words? I thought that was a very good question. 
<coughs> I first give some of the replies that some have given, and then, yeah. So this is Mark Johnson. He says, most of us have an idealized image of the Buddha as a teacher, so full of compassion and skillful means that he would not have truly done or said these things. Dare we consider that the Buddha would occasionally make mistakes or choose words that were not always the wisest or best choice? We have a superhuman image of the Buddha. Could he, after his enlightenment, still have been quite human and not always perfect? Does being a Buddha mean perfection in all human and social interactions? Yeah, I thought that was a very wise comment. We we find this even in in tradition, like I, there there there's there's uh, passages where the Buddha is described as taking a rest because his back is aching, and then the commentaries come up with all kind of explanation that no no the Buddha didn't have any pain. You see, he just did this to give his disciples uh, an opportunity to teach. There's this this tendency of uh, of of seeing that the uh, total purity of the mind being completely free from any kind of defilements does not necessarily mean absolute, total, and complete perfection in all and everything. And there was another reply here by by Rosa Grau. <clears throat> she says, such a long oral and written transmission allows for all kind of mixes, alternations, alterations, I'm sorry, misinterpretations and all sorts of phenomena that can be attributed to human intervention. An explanation could be that people who put the suttas in writing were not as kind and compassionate as the teacher. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a good line of thinking. I personally think the I would give main emphasis to the oral transmission here and I'm, I'm not sure if uh, at the time that material has been written down uh, there would have happened major changes this is not my interpretation my impression so far but in an oral transmission uh, this can be more easily imagined the uh, Buddhist monks were not trained from the early youth uh, in memorization, unlike the Vedic reciters. So even though they were trying to transmit things uh, correctly as much as they could, and uh, the early Buddhist oral transmission is not just a matter of free improvisation, we can imagine how uh, a, a certain situation can evolve during being transmitted down. Say the Buddha just says it, and now I tell somebody else, and I feel upset about this Udayin or about Ananda. And so the way how I'm reporting the situation, it just gets a little bit stronger. Ananda, you should really not have done this. And passing on a few generations, then the way uh, the Buddha's words have become has become just much more stronger than they originally were. There's a one case, one case study I made. Um, there's a one discourse, I have it here, the Chula Sangha. One <coughs> basic situation is there's this debater, Sachika, and so he makes a big announcement. I'm going to challenge the Buddha and I'm going to flatten him out. You all come and see. So he goes with all his followings and they all believe that he's a saint. He goes with all his followers in front of the Buddha and they have a debate and you will not be surprised. The Buddha wins the debate. Satchaka is uh, totally defeated in front of his people. So what he does is uh, he invites the Buddha for a meal and he tells his followers, you help me prepare by preparing the meal. He's also some sort of wandering debater so he would not have had the means to provide a meal for the Buddha and his monks. So the next day, I think... <coughs> Yeah, the next day the Buddha and the monks come and they take the meal. And at the end of the meal, uh, this uh, debate, as Satchika says, so I would like to dedicate the, the merit of this offering to, to my followers. So here we have a situation where, I mean, good, he has challenged the Buddha publicly, but he has admitted his defeat. He has kind of more or less apologized. He makes a 
offering of a meal, and then he makes a dedication of merit. And what the Buddha says is, I read from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, whatever comes about from giving to a recipient such as yourself, one who is not free from lust, not free from hate, not free from delusion, that will be for the givers. Whatever comes about from giving to a recipient such as myself, one who is free from lust, free from hate, free from delusion, that will be for you. <laughs> I have always had problem with this, but I mean, the, the statement is interesting in two ways, and I will come to the second way later, but how is it possible that the Buddha could be so resentful? I mean, this fellow has just said sorry, he's making a meal often, he wants to dedicate the merit in front of his followers who have prepared the meal, who think this is a saintly person, you tell him, look, the people who have made the meal in your name, they won't get much merits because they gave it to you. You only get the merits because you give to somebody like me. <clears throat> so one gets a real strange impression. And I studied the Chinese parallels. And in one Chinese parallel, we get quite a different situation. We have uh, the Buddha makes that statement about the merit, but he doesn't make it in front of this debater. He makes it much later. The monks and the Buddha have taken their meal. They go home to the home to the monastery, and on the way to the monastery, the monks start discussing, hey, these followers, how much merits they get? And the debater, how much does he get? And the Buddha just explains it to them. You see, look, these followers have prepared the meal for this fellow, so they only get the merits of giving to him, and he is not an arahan, but he has then given that meal to me, and so he gets the full merit. Completely different situation. And this just comes from shifting this small piece of text, the words the Buddha says to a little bit later place in the sutta, which can easily happen during, during oral transmission, not necessarily somebody who is now manipulating or whatever. And as an aside to my main topic, the passage is also interesting because it's actually a canonical statement that puts into question the idea of transference of merit. Here the Satchika wants to transfer merit, and the Buddha says, uh, can't do, but that is not our main topic. I just wanted to, to, to make this point to say that uh, some of the passages where the Buddha appears to be acting in a way that we would not expect of somebody who is fully awakened could be the results of some problem in the transmission of the text. But there's also another perspective, and here I come back to Manfred Wiesberger. He says, I consider it absolutely plausible that the Buddha used words that affected his audience according to their background in a way that benefited them in the long run. That line of thinking seems for me to be more reasonable than attributing everything which does not fit our current modern humanistic ideas to a flaw in the transmission of the teachings. And I think that's, that's a good warning also. We should, we should um, beware of the problem of projecting our own modern day perceptions too much into the text and seeing anything that doesn't fit them as, as a problem. We, we can find a, find a kind of middle way. I, I, I clearly Is it better now? Oh gosh! What was the last thing you heard me saying? <laughs> oh, this technical stuff. Mm. 
<coughs> about two minutes lost. Did you still hear me talking about the Sachaka story? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I have given that example of uh, Sachaka. And I am going to start with uh, Manfred Wiesberger again. I'm, I'm sorry about this. <coughs> so he says, I consider it absolutely... Let me just check if everything is being registered. No, I'm getting nervous. I <laughs> know it's working. <laughs> Good. I consider it absolutely plausible that the Buddha used words that affected his audience according to their background in a way that benefited them in the long run. That line of thinking seems for me to be more reasonable than attributing everything which does not fit our current modern humanistic ideas to a flaw in the transmission of the teachings. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good very good point that sets also a limit to our attributing things to transmission problems that we should also see that we cannot read excuse me our own world view into the teachings. We cannot expect that everything meets our present day expectations because the ancient world was different. And with that, I am certainly not wanting to say uh, that uh, uh, going in the direction of crazy wisdom, of the idea that the Arahant is beyond being judged and can do whatever he or she wants. I think Rosa Grau took up that topic on the blog, and I feel very much in agreement with what she says. And there's a very beautiful discourse in the middle long collection, number 47, the V. Mangsaka Sutta. I have also translated the Chinese parallel and done a paper on that, where the Buddha makes himself, opens himself up to a very searching investigation and says, anybody who wants, who thinks of becoming my disciple, check me out very thoroughly. So that is perfectly in line with 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 the, with the teachings that uh, uh, there is no no way of excusing immoral behavior by saying look I am I am I have transcended all this you you just don't understand so it's another comment by Mark I have two more comments and then there's time again for questions. <coughs> I think we have to admit that we just don't always understand the context of all of the dialogues in the discourses. And since so many of the discourses readily display the boundless wisdom and compassion of the Buddha, I am inclined to think that the few that leave us puzzled as to the Buddha's response were likely very fitting responses in that time and situation. Yeah, it's like, like uh, I think somebody on the blog mentioned this Moga Purisa. You're, you're a fool. I personally also think this is a very strong word, but it's it's not. It might just have been, uh, hey, don't be silly, something like that in the ancient setting. And also, we might want to keep in mind that you see, in those ancient times, for anybody to come to know about what the Buddha teaches, the only way was by hearsay. So if uh, somebody who officially is dressed uh, as a Buddhist monk and thus as a disciple of the Buddha walks around giving out what is totally wrong and being told by other monks, hey, this is wrong, don't say that, he keeps on insisting, no, no, this is the way I understand the teaching, it's like this, then there is also the occasion for a somewhat stronger term to be used, like, hey, Mogapurisa, I mean, <laughs> who told you this? So, yeah, there's some room for that. And there's a final comment, and then I'm back with you for any kind of question by Linda Grace. And she says, I find it very powerful and beautiful, the, the Madhyama Agama version, although I prefer the Anguttara version in terms of the rebuke, is that not only that the Buddha makes it clear that silence was not an appropriate response, but he frames it in terms of compassion. And that is also something that really struck me. Anyhow, the ball is with you. Kongmu, can you give us that reference button? 
Uh, I suppose you mean the Vimangsaka Sutta. That is Majjhima Nikaya 47, if I remember right. Let me check. <coughs> yeah. And you find this uh, page 415 of Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translation. And then this Anali and one of this 1001. Articles is written on it, which uh, you can also download from the internet. I'm making publicity for myself. Uh, the topic of the article is the scope of free inquiry. So there you get the Chinese uh, uh, version translated. It's from the Madhyama Agama also. And uh, a little discussion of the significance. I find this a very, very powerful discourse, even stronger than the Kalama Sutta, which is usually being quoted as the Buddha's chart of free inquiry. Anyhow, after a little publicity for myself, uh, any content-wise question to... I'm, I've come to the end of my discussion of the blog, and any, any comment or question or query you have in relation to what I presented, now is a good time to put it into the chat. <coughs> well, I hope you're not getting tired of me. <laughs> yeah, and then I, I think I, I go for our first discourse. There was um, several... Students on the blog noticed that in the discourse we had last time, there was this other monk, Kalara, who the way he was uh, saying oh, to the Buddha, oh, look, Sariputta said this and that, it gives us the impression that he was trying to find fault. And uh, this is actually a, a theme that, that runs through these first discourses of the Arahant, and particularly Sariputta being being open, being being criticized, being censored, not being being seen uh, for what he is. There's a very well-known story which we are not going to cover now by a, about a monk by the name of Kokalika, and he had a real hatred, apparently, according to what the texts say, towards Sariputta and Mahamogalana. I, I checked with Malala Sekara. It's not clear if that is the same Kokalika as uh, the one who was a follower of Devadatta. Uh, sources are apparently not clear if these were two different people or one. But it's it's clear that uh, at the Buddha's lifetime, as far as we are able to tell from the text, that those who we now know are his two chief disciples. Uh, didn't have an easy time. Particularly Sariputta seems to have been often the object of unfounded allegation, criticism, etc. And this is this is interesting for us to to, to know just that in in this case, who somebody who was an arahant and who must have been very pure uh, was not recognized by everybody. And this come we're coming back to the topic I just broached before. So there is no no crazy wisdom, actual misconduct by somebody. We can clearly draw an inference. This person is not a fully awakened one. But uh, what Michael, I think Mark also said, or Michael, I don't remember that the, the, this this idea of this this total perfection uh, without making the slightest mistake is going a little bit too far sometimes. If these are minor mistakes that are not motivated by defilement, and that we are sometimes not able to recognize somebody for the qualities or for the level of awakening he or she has, and so it's it's always good when dealing with uh, spiritual teachers, particularly, to be a little wary of just going by rumors, and to try to find a middle way between blind faith, letting anything happen because, well, my teacher says so, and the excessive skepticism that keeps on f wanting to find fault at the at the smallest little thing. Okay, before I go into the discourse, let me just see Lisa. 
TNH suggests that right speech would always contribute to healing. Don't know if this is a Mahayana test for right speech. Sorry, try to find the reference. We'll post it later on the book. TNH would be Tignatan, I suppose. And um, right speech would always contribute to healing. Yeah, there is. Um, I believe we went through that in the last course on the Abhaya Rajakumara Sutta. There's a, a, a very telling survey of what type of speech the Buddha uses, and that can be unpleasant speech as long as it is truthful and beneficial in the long run. Yeah. Now we get into the discourse. Majjhimanikaya 24. So the setting of the discourse is uh, Buddha and uh, Sariputta, his chief disciple, you know. They are both observing the rainy season retreat, the three months of the rainy period when the monks uh, stay in one place in Savati. And so after the rainy season retreat is over, Sariputta takes his leave. He says, goes to the Buddha and says, I'm going to walk around in the country. And he leaves. And then another monk comes, goes to the Buddha and says, Look, that Sariputta, he's just slighted me. And then he left. And so the Buddha quickly tells another monk, You go and get Sariputta before he leaves. And he brings Sariputta back. And in the meantime, while that happened, the rumors already spread. Ananda has heard what's happening and tells all the other monks, You come, come. There's going to be a discussion about this. So Venerable Sariputta comes back. And the Buddha says, Look, you just after you left, another monk came and he said you slighted him and without excusing or anything you just left. And now we're gonna get the way how an arahant reacts to a false accusation. At the end of the discourse we will find out that this accusation was false. I read the discourse for you. <coughs> Majjhimanikaya twenty four. The Venerable Sariputta said, Blessed one. Someone who lacks mindfulness of the body in regard to the body might well slight a companion in the holy life just before setting out to journey among the people. I, however, am well equipped with mindfulness of the body in regard to the body. How could I slight a companion in the holy life just before setting out to journey among the people? You see already how he, how he reacts? I mean, uh, I, 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 I was originally planning to read through the whole thing, but I have to comment on this right away. You see, if that happened to me, <laughs> you know what I would say? Hey, who is that? What is he saying? Absolutely wrong. He's lying. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and here he says, no, no, I didn't do it. Or what is he saying? He says, look, if somebody of this type, it might happen, but I'm not of that type. It, it won't happen in my case. So he is able to clarify that he didn't do that without bringing in, I didn't do it, without accusing the other, and in a very elegant and diplomatic way. Yeah, I, I find that very part, very touching. And now he gives us a series of similes. Last course we had a lot of joy with these different similes, so I'm happy we're getting a few more similes. <laughs> He's now illustrating his attitude towards this false accusation with a series of similes. And I keep on reading. <coughs> Blessed one, it is just as a dehorned ox that is patient and docile, being thoroughly tamed, causes no harm wherever it goes, whether from village to village or from street to street. Blessed one, I am like this, having a mind like a dehorned ox. <coughs> Free from fetish or resentment, without ill will or quarrel, I dwell pervading the entire world with the mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Just for us to understand this references to the boundless mind is an indirect reference to the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Continue with the Sutta, the second simile. Blessed one. It is just as a son of an outcast whose two hands have been cut off, being utterly humbled, 
causes no harm wherever he goes, whether from village to village or from town to town. Blessed one, I am like this. My mind is like the son of an outcast whose two hands have been cut off. Free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel, I dwell pervading the entire world with the mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Already an outcast has to, in ancient Indian society, be very, very keeping to the sides and be very humble. And he even has his two hands cut off for whatever reason. Now he gets into the elements. Blessed one, it is just as the earth receives what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, without feeling embarrassed, ashamed or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this, my mind is like the earth, free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel. I dwell pervading the entire world with the mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable and well cultivated. Blessed one, it is just as water washes away what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, without feeling embarrassed, ashamed or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this, my mind is like that water, free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel. I dwell pervading the entire world with a mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Blessed one, it is just as fire that burns out what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot, and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, <coughs> without feeling embarrassed, ashamed, or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this. My mind is like that fire, free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel. I dwell pervading the entire world with a mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Blessed one, it is just as the wind blows away what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot, and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, without feeling embarrassed, ashamed, or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this, my mind is like the wind free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel, I dwell pervading the entire world with a mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Now we get another simile. <coughs> Blessed one, it is just as a broom that sweeps away what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot, and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, without feeling embarrassed, ashamed, or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this, my mind is like a broom, free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel. I dwell pervading the entire world with a mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Blessed one, it is just as a cleaning rack that wipes away what is pure and what is impure, excrement, urine, snot, and spittle, without for this reason hating it or liking it, without feeling ashamed or humiliated. Blessed one, I am like this, my mind is like a cleaning rag. Free from fetters or resentment, without ill will or quarrel, I dwell pervading the entire world with a mind that is boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well cultivated. Now come the final two, which I already told you before, I find a little bit problematic. Blessed one, it is just as when a jug with many cracks has been filled to the brim with grease and placed in the sun. The grease leaks and oozes out everywhere. If a man with good eyesight comes and stands beside it, he sees this jug of grease with many cracks, which has been filled to the brim and placed in the sun, and he sees the grease leaking and oozing out everywhere. Blessed one, I too am like this. I constantly contemplate the impurity of this body with its nine orifices leaking and oozing out everywhere. And the last one. Blessed one, it is just as a joyful youth might bathe and perfume himself with fragrances, put on white clean clothes and adorn himself with jewels. And having shaved his beard and ranged his hair, might place flowers on his head. Suppose that three kinds of corpse 
are then garlanded around his neck. A dead snake, a dead dog, and a dead human being, discolored, bloated, foul-smelling, rotten, and oozing putrid fluids. That youth would feel embarrassed and ashamed, filled with utter disgust. Blessed one, I am like this. As I constantly contemplate the foul and impure parts of this body, my mind is embarrassed and ashamed and filled with utter disgust. So now we look at the comparative <coughs> perspective. I have uh, listed uh, Madhyama Agama 10 similes above, and we have 9 similes in the Anguttara Nikaya. The first one that we find, and which those of you who have been joining me last year will be very familiar with, uh, very often we get variations in sequence. This is very normal in orally transmitted literature and has normally, with some exceptions, no deeper meaning. So if we look at what uh, comes together here, we find that uh, basically we get the same similes. One difference is that the Madhyama Agama has uh, number seven, the broom, and number eight, the cleaning rag. And there we might in fact wonder what the point is of speaking of a cleaning rag when the broom has already been brought in. Let me see. Yeah. There's a small difference here. Number six in the Pali speaks of an outcast girl. Its equivalent number two in the Chinese is an outcast and whose hands have been cut off. But um, yeah, the, the difference is not major. Now, coming back to uh, the point I was making about methodology. The simile that I find particularly difficult is number 10 in the Madhyama Agama and which corresponds to number 8 in the, in the Pali version. We have it in both versions. Therefore, what I'm going to say now is my personal opinion and it is not methodologically based on the comparative study. But what I would like us to note is <clears throat> if we go back, you see, all of the earlier similes in both versions, they mention this boundless, exalted, immeasurable, and well-cultivated mind. It is only with number 9 and 10 that we suddenly don't get this anymore. This is a, 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 an irregularity in the presentation which is unexpected. And so my hypothesis, but very clearly this is just an opinion, is it could be that at a time in the transmission before the transmission lineage of what we now have in the, is it Majima Nikaya or Anguttara Nikaya? And in the Madhyama Agama, before these two split into different transmission, that these last two were added. And it would have been natural because of all this speaking about impure excrement, urine, snot, and spittle in the earlier versions, that by way of association, this would attract the idea of the jug with its many cracks and then about the carcass on the neck. And when they were added during oral transmission, uh, they, were not, they, were, they were taken from a different context and they, uh, the, they were not fully adjusted to the content because we do not get the uh, final part on developing the Brahma Viharas. But as I'm saying, this is just a hypothesis of mine and this is based on my study of the role of the body in Buddhist meditation, some topic that I'm at present preparing a paper on. And it seems to me that an arahant would have a neutral attitude towards the body. I, I can't see personally that an arahant says my mind is embarrassed, ashamed, and filled with utter disgust. Yeah. I have here the party. I'm sorry, I was promising not to give you the party, but I had it already there, so this time I hope I'm forgotten. Eva me eva koahang bhandi imina puti kayena atanti yami hara yami jigutin chami. In the same way, Venerable Sir, I'm repelled, 
horrified and disgusted with this body. And in the Madhya Mahagama, we have the similar thing. I constantly contemplate the foul and impure part of this body. My mind is embarrassed, ashamed, and filled with utter disgust. We get some such statements in a very specific context where, like, for example, a nun is being accosted by somebody who is trying to, 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 maybe even trying to rape her by trying to have sex with her and where it makes sense for her to say, look, I'm, I'm just disgusted with this body. I'm not interested in sex. But in the present context, I find this a little difficult. But again, uh, I, I, and I hope I'm, I'm, I'm making my, my point very methodologically clear. What I'm saying is based on, on I believe there is an inconsistency in the presentation because that final part is missing and I believe it does not fit what I think would be the attitude of an Aran towards his body. But I'm not on methodologically firm ground here. I am now sharing the same ground with Caroline Rice Davids and Ivy Horner, etc. It is just an opinion of mine. And please take it as that and feel totally free to disagree. What is really important about this uh, discourse, I think, uh, if we if we just bracket this this final two, is uh, that it teaches us, and I hope I'm coming back, being a little bit practical now again. It teaches us how to react to the false accusation. You see, somebody is making a false accusation, and it is our duty to clarify what has happened, not just keeping keeping out of it completely. But he does it in such a way that it's not a direct attack of the other. As I was making the caricature of myself, how I would react in such a situation, that was not the way to do it. He just says, look, I am somebody who is like this wouldn't do it, and I'm of that type. It's, it's a very, very clear statement, but at the same time it's so, 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 so diplomatically phrased that there is no direct attack of the other. <clears throat> And then he goes into this beautiful uh, similes that describe uh, the humility and patience he has, even when people make false accusations. Like an ox without horns, uh, this makes maybe less sense to us now in the modern West, but if you have been to India and seen those that still have their horns and come close to them when they don't want you to be close, you know what he's talking about. Like an outcast, like the four elements. This is particularly powerful, I think. It's a completely different perspective on the four elements than we get in the Satipatthana Sutta, where the idea is to see that our own body is the same as outside nature. But here they are actually used to inculcate a mental attitude of, of patience and humility, like a broom. And all of these lead on to the Brahma Vihara. So, the, the the divine abodes, the loving kindness, etc. So the, the the occasion of being falsely accused by someone else, of being directly attacked in front of the person that Sarya Buddha would have cared most about in the whole world, in front of the Buddha himself. He immediately uses that as an occasion. This is this is this is my chance to practice Brahma Vihara. Here I am. My mind stays open, broad, boundless. Yeah, that was what I had on this discourse. Now let me see, there have been a few <coughs> few comments. Looks like variations that have been added by Rosa Grau. I am not entirely sure because I, I had to concentrate on the text, so I'm not sure when this came and what it refers to. Juliana Martini, she says, the three types of corpse, corpse simile seems to be the only one that has no liking or disliking, but utter dis Yes. In fact, and Martha Turner, inconsistency in the text may be a stronger ground than not fitting with your own opinion. Yeah, definitely, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah, the, uh, Rosa Grau was saying about the broom and the rex. Yeah, I, I think that might be a simple case where uh, in the repetitive nature of oral transmission, uh, there may have been unclarity. Somebody thought it's broom, somebody thought it's rags, and then, then they, we end up with two. Yeah, it happens in other suttas, exactly. <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Marta, that was a very nice comment, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it looks like we still have time to get into the second. It's actually nice if we take on the second one. It's not as long as the other one, 
and it's on the same topic, more or less. It's about overcoming resentment. <coughs> so we are with Majima Agama 25, discourse on water similes. <coughs> this is just an exposition given by Saniputta to the monks. Sariputta addressed the monks. Venerable friends, I shall explain to you five methods for overcoming resentment. Suppose there is a forest-dwelling monk, a wearer of red robes, who sees a discarded piece of cloth in a cesspool, stained by excrement, urine, snot, spittle and other impurities. On seeing it, he holds it with his left hand and spreads it out with his right hand. And wherever he sees portions that are not stained by excrement, urine, snot, spittle or other impurities, and that are without holes, he takes them off and takes them to make a rag robe. This is a, a practice and done in ancient times by the monks and nuns, and also still sometimes practiced nowadays, that uh, a, a, a robe is not made out of a new cloth, but that one collects rags to make a robe out of it. <clears throat> it's nowadays reckoned as one of the ascetic practices, and it uh, stands as a symbol for an ascetic uh, forest monk approach. I continue the sutta. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, venerable friends, if there is someone whose bodily actions are not pure, but whose verbal actions are pure. One should not pay attention to his impure bodily actions, but pay attention only to his pure verbal actions. This is how a wise person who, on seeing such an individual, is aroused to resentment or to rid himself of that resentment. So we get this image of uh, there's uh, impure bodily conduct, but pure verbal conduct. So just as... Uh, out of a dirty piece of cloth, we, we take out that little bit that can be used. We, we, we pay attention to the wholesome part. Second simile. <coughs> I read again. Suppose that not far from a village, there's a deep pool whose surface is covered with water plants. And suppose that a man comes along who is oppressed by extreme heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion caused by a hot wind. On arriving at the pool, he takes off his clothes, puts them on the bank and enters the pool, pushing aside the water plants with both hands. He enjoys a pleasant bath and rids himself of the oppression by heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion. Similarly, venerable friends, if there is someone whose verbal actions are not pure, but whose bodily actions are pure, one should not pay attention to his impure verbal actions, but should pay attention only to his pure bodily actions. This is how a wise person who, on seeing such an individual, is aroused to resentment, ought to rid himself of that resentment. So here the image we get of a, of, of, of a water, a pool, a lake, and uh, we want to get at the water, but it's it's covered by water plants, as happens quite often in Asia. And so you, you, need to, you need to push them aside in order to be able to get at the water. And in the same way, we disregard uh, this other person's unwholesome words and uh, speech, and we just push them aside uh, mentally uh, so that we can get at the, at the, at least bodily, at least his actions are pure, or her actions are pure. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> Third simile. <coughs> Suppose that at a crossroads there's a puddle of water in the depression made by an ox's hoof. And suppose that the man comes along who is oppressed by extreme heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion caused by a hot wind. He thinks to himself, this ox's hoof print at the crossroad contains a little water. If I were to scoop it up with my hand or with a leaf, the water would become muddied, and I would not be able to rid myself of the oppression by heat, 
hunger, thirst, and exhaustion. Let me kneel down with hands and knees on the ground and suck up the water directly with my mouth. He then kneels down with hands and knees on the ground and sucks up the water directly with his mouth and so is able to rid himself of the oppression by heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion. <laughs> Similarly, Venerable Friends, if there is someone whose bodily and verbal actions are impure, but whose mind is pure to a small extent, one should not pay attention to his impure bodily and verbal actions, but should pay attention only to his mind, which is pure to a small extent. This is how a wise person who, on seeing such an individual, is aroused to resentment, ought to rid himself of that resentment. This is a very stark image if we keep in mind the ancient Indian regard for the higher parts of the body compared to the lower parts of the body and so to go down on the knees and hands and go down with the mouth to where a cow has had her foot and suck that up is a is an extremely humbling uh, image in 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 the ancient Indian setting. Yeah, and uh, needless to say, the whole question that we are discussing here is about getting rid of resentment. The point is not to 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 to, to completely ignore that in a different setting. The question is, when we are getting upset about it, how do we get out of being upset? Similarly, number four. <coughs> Suppose a person is on a long journey and, having become ill on the way, is suffering greatly and exhausted. He is alone, without a companion. The village behind him is far away, and the village ahead has not yet been reached. Suppose that a second person comes along and, standing to one side, looks at this first person. And suppose that he helps that sick traveler to get through the wilderness and reach the next village, and there gives him excellent medicine and good sustaining food, caring for him well. In that case, that person's illness would most certainly subside. That is to say, the second person is extremely compassionate towards the sick person, having a heart full of loving kindness. Similarly, venerable friends, if there is a person whose bodily, verbal and mental actions are all impure, then a wise person on seeing him thinks, this person's bodily, verbal and mental actions are all impure, but let him not, on the breaking up of the body at death, go to a bad realm of existence and be born, reborn in hell as a consequence of his impure bodily, verbal and mental actions. If this impure person encounters a good friend, he may give up his impure bodily, verbal and mental actions and cultivate pure bodily, verbal and mental actions. In that case, through cultivating pure bodily, verbal and mental actions, this reformed person will, on the breaking up of the body at death, go to a good realm of existence, be reborn in a heavenly realm. That is to say, this wise person is extremely compassionate towards that impure person, having a heart full of loving kindness. This is how a wise person who on seeing such an individual is aroused to resentment or to rid himself of that resentment. So here we get the next case. This person is just through and through impure and that is just the ideal object for developing compassion. And now we get the final case. Suppose that not far from a village there's a pool, full to the brim with clear, beautiful water, its banks covered with verdant grass and surrounded by flowering trees. Suppose that a man comes along who is oppressed by extreme heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion caused by a hot wind. On arriving at the pool, he takes off his clothes, puts them on the bank and enters the water. He enjoys a pleasant bath and rids himself of the oppression by heat, hunger, thirst and exhaustion. Similarly, venerable friends, if there is someone whose bodily, verbal and mental actions are all pure, 
then one should constantly pay attention to his pure bodily, verbal and mental actions. This is how a person, wise person, who on seeing such an individual is aroused to resentment ought to rid himself of that resentment. I think it's interesting that the last case takes up somebody who is pure and still speaks of resentment. And my own my own suspicion is that uh, Sariputta may have been well aware that of the fact that even though he was pure bodily, verbal, and mentally, uh, there were evidently others who felt resentment towards him. Yeah, so we get uh, these five similes. First one, I a bodily impurity is like a dirty cloth. You just take only what is clean. And I'm, I'm, I'm personal... Uh, idea I have is I find it interesting that we get this example of the rag robes and the forest monks, and I I I I my my I find it very inspiring in so far as uh, strict monks. I I when I when I just ordained I was very very strict, and I found that being very strict with myself, I was also very easily judgmental uh, towards others. I was very um, very good at knowing what others were doing wrong <laughs> and in the meantime I have found a way of still being a strict uh, monk but without getting judgmental about others and these kind of images are, have been very helpful and the second one the verbal impurity it's like plants on a water surface you just push it aside they're not a real problem. It's If we look from afar, then it looks like there is no lake because everything is green. But if we come a little closer, we can just push them a little aside. We see there's water. We push a little more, get more water, and we get what we, what we, what we really need. <coughs> and the third one, the bodily and verbal impurity. This person is acting wrongly with the body and uh, with words. And we get this uh, image of this is like water in the hoof of an ox. We kneel down to take whatever little you can get from it. Yeah, it it gives, as I already said, it gives a real uh, feeling of humility. And without uh, any pride, you you just you you are willing to go to whatever you can do to get out that little bit that can be got. Then somebody is totally impure like a sick person alone in the wilderness and yeah that as i said how how can we not have compassion when somebody is so completely lost <coughs> and the last one yeah if somebody is pure rejoicing in in that purity of others instead of feeling envious jealous and having resentment yeah i find this there's no major differences between the two versions that I would like to discuss. And this, 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 these similes are very, very powerful. And now there's uh, still a little bit of time for us to to discuss anything in relation to this discourse. Now there's already one comment by Juliana. <coughs> Juliana Martini shows that holding resentment has a lot to do with misguidedly placing and keeping one's intention on certain details in the other person's behavior, etc., and that instead a boundless mind is unable to focus on and grasp disturbing details, making it making a whole story out of them. Yeah, that's a very good observation. That is indeed the case. When I get upset with somebody, it's usually that my mind replays uh, like 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 that, like an eternal replay that that goes on in my mind, going on. Like he said that he should not have said that, but he did say that, and he should not have said that. And it gets choo 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 choo, and the vision becomes very very narrow and focused on that which I think is not correct and which hurt me and which maybe was also not correct. But if I practice the Brahma Viharas in this 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 open, broad attitude, then there is no longer this this. Uh, I don't know how you call that. Like you know, the horses have these blink blinkers. I think they are called, where they, they 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 cannot see to the sides. They c they can only see what is in front. And you 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 take off those blinkers, and you realize yes, that that was wrong. But there are so many other also good good things about that person. Stuart Corner, uh, I guess that we can use these similes for resentment that we have towards ourselves too. 
<laughs> but you will know yourself uh, if you are impure or not. No? Lisa, thank God. Where does the attention go? To that which is a target for our ill will or that which provides nutriment for good qualities to arise? Yeah, that is, that is the crucial question, I think. Oops. <coughs> and it, it, it is basically attention is something amenable to our, our decision. We can shift it. It naturally goes to that which has aroused our ill will, but we can we can we can consciously, with the help of even intellectual reflection on these similes, or as Juliana has pointed out, with the help of broadening our our mind, having this broad idea, we can naturally shift it either to step back from the situation, see it in this broader perspective, or to con consciously have a shift over to to see something something good. It depends, I assume, on the strength of the resentment. When we are really upset and angry, I guess it will be difficult to just sit back and practice uh, metta. It will probably be necessary to make a really strong effort to, to bring up something positive, to make ourselves realize, look, this is the picture you have is, is not complete. Dania Percy, I'm wondering if we apply that advice, advice <coughs> then we wouldn't correct mistakes that happen. A few minutes ago, we saw the Buddha advice to correct a misrepresentation. But if we let it go, we won't want to correct it. I much rather let it go. Well, as I try to say, Danya, that the point is about resentment. So, uh, just a very, very simple example. Uh, uh, last week, uh, somebody, it's in relation to some publication, somebody wrote something to me and I got upset about it. So I did not reply. Because I was in a state of upset, I felt that it was totally incorrect what they were doing and not appropriate, and so I, I just stopped myself from doing something. And I have had a few days in between, I've done my meditation, and now today I was able to reply in a just uh, calm and balanced manner, without resentment, and just clarifying, look, the situation is like this, like this. Uh, I would prefer if we do it like this, and can it be done like this? Would you be okay with that? So so that that is the whole point. The point is not that... Uh, uh, in, in this particular situation, I'm mentioning what the others were doing were wrong, was wrong. There's no, no question about that. But the point is that I can only appropriately deal with that situation if I am balanced myself. If I take my stance on, look, what you're doing is wrong, this is wrong, and I feel resentment about it, the way I'm going to deal with that situation, the other person is surely going to get hurt. And surely they're going to come back with something. It's not going to work even if I look at it only from the situation of dealing with, with, with the problem. But if I, if I take that little step back and I wait until I have become calm and then I see, look, this is where they're coming from. They're not doing that to hurt me. This is just their situation. And how from their situation can we find a solution that works with my ideas? It's a completely different picture. So she gives an... Are you, I have already answered your next question, it seems. <laughs> Yeah, for instance, uh, so she just says somebody yelled at her, and whether sh you should explain it to her or just ignore her. Well, uh, um, yeah, and you you already said uh, a minute. If, yeah, the, the the question is sometimes uh, in the situation itself, if we don't get upset, we are ready to 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 deal with it right away. But that is the whole point of 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 meditating also to know: Am I now reacting because I got upset, or am I just dealing with the situation, that, that, that inner feeling, that inner sensitivity, uh, whether my way of uh, uh, replying to the situation is based on a full picture of the situation or just on my narrow idea that I'm angry and I want to finish it, get rid of it or something. Rosa Grau says, we often want to change others but not ourselves. Yeah, that's the point. Right on the spot, exactly. If only everybody one else would be nice, life would be so easy, no? <laughs> Not the perspective of a Dharma practitioner. Thank you very much for giving us all these problems. 
Thank you very much for making my life difficult because my opportunity to practice. Mark says the same, yeah. I think I said that I told that story already last uh, last year, but I, 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 I may be forgiven for repeating the same story. I was uh, as many years ago at a, a Tibetan monastery up in uh, in the Kathmandu Valley, and there was one monk, and a very old and tiny monk, and uh, what was so noticeable about him was that you did not notice him. He was like like a shadow. He was not there. And then somebody told me that he had been tortured by the Chinese for 20 years. And they asked him after, when they finally released him, they found out he was not a spy, they thought he was a spy or something. And they said, I mean, he only spoke Tibetan, and I don't speak enough Tibetan. Uh, uh, And the reply he gave was, it really improved my practice, you see. And I find this statement still so powerful. And I keep reminding this monk with this, this, he absolutely had, he, he was just so soft and so no ego uh, at all, no, no carrying himself in front of himself, that you wouldn't notice him unless you really looked, ah, he's there. And this idea that 20 years being systematically tortured in, in prison, and the only thing he has to say is, it really improved my practice. This is a, an image I keep, uh, keep using myself when I have this, uh, in comparison, ridiculous little problems, trying to improve my practice. Yeah, Juliana Martini shows that holding resentment has a lot to do with misguidedly placing and keeping one's attention on certain details in the other person's behavior, and that instead a boundless mind is unable to focus. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, that's oh, okay. That we had that already. In my experience, I sometimes find myself mulling over whether I should say or fix something somebody because, in fact, this is easier than feeling upset, projecting the next action, thinking I'm wise and compassionate, such like, just an excuse. Yeah. Martha Turner, I'm interested that the man in the text is oppressed by extreme heat, etc. Oops. The starting point for this involves strong and rather stressful motivation to find what is good. Yeah. We are coming to the end, I think. I read the last two comments and then we close. When we Kongmu, but this seems like one of these suttas that can be easily misunderstood in that this is not saying that we should condone other people's unwholesome behavior. Rather, it is, as you kindly say, a teaching on how to let get of resentment. Yeah, that is also very clear in the suttas. Good that you make that point again. It is on how to get rid of resentment. Not a total charter on how to deal with unwholesome behavior. And Lisa? Fankart, the Lion's Roar suggests that there are times when we must in fact draw boundaries. Yeah. But in many cases, as a Buddhist, right speech does not mean not standing up for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Helping others learn to respect these boundaries are important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That is that is not the question. We had that already, I think, last week about uh, uh, mental tranquility and not being involved. Yeah. The Sutta is on, and I think this is even the title, no? on how to get rid of his resentment, or it's at least what Sariputta says in the introduction. I shall explain to you five methods for overcoming resentment. That is the topic. Anyhow, I've been overdrawing for two minutes. I hope you will forgive me for that. Thank you very much for listening to me, for being there present, and for all your Uh, very helpful and nice comments and questions and I look forward to seeing you again next week and I am already now curious to see what is going to happen on the blog because this is becoming really fascinating for me to see all the different ideas and opinions that are coming out. Right, goodbye.